Hey, superstars. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Aaron Zakowski, and today I'm chatting with Corey Haynes. Corey is the head of growth at Bear Metrics, a tool to help SaaS companies to measure important revenue metrics and analytics. In addition to his work at Bear Metrics, Corey also has several side hustles that I encourage you to check out, such as swipefiles.co. How are you doing, Corey? Good. Thanks for having me. For sure. It's great to have you here. Amazing. Yeah, um, I can't wait to get started. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and kind of um, your background, how you got into SaaS marketing growth and all this stuff, and maybe a little bit about Bear Metrics as well. Yeah. So um, born and raised in San Diego. And um, let's see, I work remotely at Bear Metrics uh, and really, I mean, just kind of my passion and even the reason why I kind of joined Bear Metrics was I love SaaS. I love working with SaaS founders and operators, um, kind of getting the, the inside peek into businesses and you know, being able to be kind of strategic and consult with people. Um, so at Bear Metrics, I mean, the, the head of growth is kind of a fancy jargony word for just marketing and sales. So handle kind of everything across the, the customer journey, if you will, uh, from acquisition through revenue, uh, the ultimate goal being growing revenue. And um, so with Bear Metrics, uh, it's actually, you know, we're kind of tr still trying to figure out the right like nomenclature and positioning, but uh, we started out as just like an analytics tool for Stripe. Now we have lots of integrations. I think we have six integrations today. Um, and then we also have a couple of additional tools focused on retention. So we have Recover, Cancellation Insights, and Messaging, basically all of which uh, is meant to help you make the most of your billing data and a lot of growth through all these insights and things we can do with your customers. Okay, great. Um, so I know the team's relatively small over there at Bear Metrics. So you guys have made a big impact, you know, in terms of the, the name recognition, I think, within the SaaS industry um, with a relatively small team. Can you tell us a little bit just about the company team size and specifically in the marketing side, you know, how big your team? Yeah, a lot of people are sometimes surprised uh, by how small we are, but we're, we're 10 people full time, um, two marketers, including myself. Uh, and so most of the team uh, is very like product focused, you know, engineers, designers. Uh, we have two customer success. Josh, our CEO and founder, um, I'm the head of growth and we have a content marketer as well. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and we're all full time we're spread across, uh, I think six different time zones. Um, so in the U S UK and Europe. Okay, great. Um, if you could share with us maybe a little bit about, you know, kind of what's been working. I mean, like I said, you know, your, your name that I think a lot of people know in the industry, you're a relatively small company. It sounds like you guys are leaning in and, doing a lot, a lot of uh, savvy stuff. I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of, you know, where's most of that growth come from you guys? Yeah, you know, historically and even to this day, a lot of it has just been built on the back of what Josh has been doing with content marketing and SEO, mm -hmm. uh, even from the early days. Now we, we've, you know, we've hit some plateaus and there's uh, times when it works better than others. And sometimes where, you know, we don't really, it's hard to pinpoint what exactly is working at all. But most of it, uh, especially up until before I came on, has just been from content marketing. And that usually comes through uh, our academy, which is kind of like our more... Um, SEO focused content, you know, like what is MRR, how mm -hmm. to calculate lifetime value, what's the difference between user churn and, and revenue churn, right? Things like that. And then we also had the Founders Journey blog, which uh, features Josh's own writing and learnings and lessons learned from running Bear Metrics, stories about other founders, um, guides and tutorials, you know, how to's and, and the things to help you grow your business. Um, and so now, I mean, that's, that's really where the majority of our traffic comes from. The majority of our leads come from the other part of that it has been just our whole kind of transparency movement with open startups. And it's been, uh, you know, it's, it's not just, um, sort of, uh, to showcase bare metrics. It's also to help other people share their own metrics and, um, be transparent. Right. But really that's been a huge driver for us as well because it showcases bare metrics, right? It's a very kind of product led growth strategy and that, uh, other companies share their bare metrics dashboards, people see it, then they, you know, get the link to bare metrics and sign up for a trial then. Um, so we actually, they're probably some of our most high converting pages. Um, and that's been a huge driver for us, which has been kind of leaning into transparency and the open startups movement. Um, one of the other things, you know, I, I think it's just been, uh, like the nature of working with our integration partners. So we partner with uh, Stripe, Braintree, Recurly, Chargebee, and then we also work with uh, Apple and Google with the App Store connections and Google Play for the mobile apps. And um, so we have some SEO through that. 
also, you know, we're listed in their kind of partner directories for a few of them. And I think there's just some inherent word of mouth of, you know, hey, we're using Stripe, we need some metrics, what do we need? And et cetera, across the board. So there's some, you know, word of mouth a little bit too. Great. Um, tell me a little bit in terms of, you know, who your ideal customers are, who, who you guys are attracting, and kind of what is that, what does that sales funnel look like in terms of how you acquire the leads? Is it is a free trial versus um, versus just being requested a demo? Like kind of how, how does it work? And who you're looking for? Yeah. So the ideal customer really um, for us is anyone with revenue who is a SaaS or subscription based business using one of the integrations, Stripe, Braintree, Recurly, Charge, B, et cetera. Um, now how that really gets down, you know, uh, not everyone is, is ideal, right? Of course we'd love the, the bigger customers, right? Cause they generate more revenue and our pricing is based off of your MRR kind of you, we fit you into these tiers or kind of buckets. Um, uh, to give you room to grow. But uh, so I'd say that our, I mean, the, the majority of our customers are in the 10 to $100,000 range in MRR, just because they're that's the where the most of the companies are. Uh, but we have people all across the board, all the way from a couple hundred uh, dollars in MRR to a few, a few million dollars in MRR. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people, you know, that make the most use of bare metrics are people who are really focused on kind of this product led growth who have a low touch sales cycle, you know, that also rely on like a freemium or a free trial or basically a way that, you know, people can get into the product easily themselves without having to go through a salesperson or, you know, a big long demo or a pilot program or something like that you might find in a lot of enterprise kind of companies or sales led organizations. Um, so the, so yeah, I mean, it's really all uh, SaaS companies, subscription based companies. Usually uh, if they're not SaaS, it's very much like, a media or content kind of business, uh, yeah. where it might be like a membership site or um, some sort of you know, publication possibly as well. And then for us, uh, really the funnel is very simple. I mean, we're, we're pretty minimalistic and we like to keep things as simple as we can. Um, but uh, you know, people come in to the site, uh, they can start a trial, that's our main call to action. So it's a free 14 day trial, no credit card required. The first thing that they were asked them to do is to connect to one of the integration partners. If they uh, can't connect, right, then they're kind of like discarded and then they're, they're told, hey, it's not a good fit, you know, uh -huh. uh, try another tool. If they are, then they're, we import, they're into the trial. We then, you know, send a few emails. I reach out to do a demo. Basically everything we can do to get them up and running and, and, and quote unquote activated, right, to see the value out of the product, show them how, how things work, um, our opinions about metrics, how you can use the metrics, getting up and started with some of the retention tools as well. And then from there, it's up to them to convert into a customer. Yes. So, so the two interesting things you said in there that were interesting to me, first is that they, they have to be working with one of those integration partners. Is that, yeah. Is that correct? So, yeah, well, the, the other option is uh, they can use our API, which some do, especially uh -huh. the ones who have like their own kind of custom billing system that they have homegrown, right? And uh, they don't use like a traditional uh, subscription management platform or processing um, platform. Uh, the other option is they can use manual subscriptions. And this is usually kind of reserved for maybe like, uh, you know, if you're a product like company, but you have that one, you know, really big enterprise company who insists on paying through wire transfer or check or invoice, and then they're not in your system typically, then you can kind of represent them there. You could also have all of your customers that way, um, but most people use one of the one-click integrations. Okay. And, th and then the other inter interesting thing it sounded like you said was that you kind of go a little bit hands-on for everybody that's coming through. You said you help them to get integrated? Yeah, we, we've tried uh, lots and lots and lots of things. I, I feel like that's one of the things that um, I've probably spent the most of my time trying to figure out and trying to crack on how can we really optimize this and make the most out of it. Yeah. Um, for uh, over a year, I was sending personalized demo videos uh, using someone's own account to customers. Basically, like an email would go out to the start of trial and say, hey, I'm Corey. By the way, can I send you a personalized video demo using your own account? All you have to do is say yes and give me permission and then I'll send it to you over Loom. And so I was doing probably 10 of those a week for a long time. Um, and we saw some pretty good results and I think that it definitely helped um, move the needle for conversions. And, you know, um, a lot of those people even now tell me, hey, I love that video that you made me or, you know, that's what I sent it to my partner. That's what made it click for us. Um, but to be honest, it just got exhausting. <laughs> and so, uh, we've tried other things like, um, not doing it all, trying to do more emails. Um, we've invested more in kind of, uh, one of the latest experiments that we've done is, uh, trying to encourage people to book a demo 
while their data is importing. So like basically within the trial experience, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work because uh, one, even though it's a huge banner that said that it's optional, people still thought that it was re required. And so they would just like book something and then automatically cancel it or they would just ghost me. Um, so it kind of wasted some time. I know a couple other things we've done. I mean, we've done the whole, you know, onboarding WYSIWYG tours. Uh, we've done, you know, many other things, but um, uh, that's where I focus on a lot of my time. We've seen some improvements. I feel like there's some things we've taken with us, but a lot of things that also haven't worked because it's just a hard nut to crack. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love the idea of, you know, the, the, the hands-on approach to, to bring customers, you know, for a personalized, you know, experience, you know, customers must love that. But from a product-led, you know, free trial type of product, we, you know, it, it sounds quite hard for people to, to stick with, like you said. Um, you said you, that worked well for you. And since you stopped doing it or moved away from it, have you seen a decline? Was that really helping you increase conversions when you did it? Yeah, when we were doing it, we definitely, because it was kind of going from zero to one. You know, we had very minimalistic um, kind of onboarding emails. And even within the app, you know, there wasn't that much kind of guidance. Uh -huh. Since I stopped doing the personalized videos, we've added more within the app more for the kind of, um, you know, DIY emails to kind of get them up and running. Uh, and then we also make it really clear that they can book a demo as well. And so now most of my interaction just comes through people who book a demo and kind of go through the effort of, uh, you know, booking it themselves, expressing interest, and then, um, you know, finding a way to get some time with me. Okay. Great. Um, going back to kind of the, the conversation we had before in terms of, of the majority of people coming through content you mentioned. Um, I've always been fascinated with, with how companies move relatively organic traffic through content, through blogs. You see they've got kind of two different blogs that have two different styles of content within them. And then moving from blog content to free trial, uh, which is essentially what it sounds like you're doing. How, how do you encourage or increase conversion rates um, from that reader to sign up stage? Yeah, one of the things, um, so there's there's probably like two funnels that we could define. One is just building the newsletter list. So, uh, you know, for future blog posts or just to get on the list for extra resources and whatnot, uh, we have a call to action for each one of the blog posts, you know, of course, to sign up for the newsletter. Mm -hmm. And that's grown significantly over time. We have a fairly large newsletter. Um, and so that way, uh, anytime we have a product announcement, a promotion, some sort of other uh, piece of content or... Um, thing that we're doing that's closely related to the product might be, be might probably even, you know, partnering with another company, for example, mm -hmm. then we'll send that out to the newsletter. And that way we kind of reconnect and we're able to harvest, you know, a couple of signups that way. The other way though, is really just trying to tie together the product in the content itself. And so of course there's going to be some blog posts, some content that's going to be very high level and really isn't going to be meant to, to convert people into signups, but there's a lot. And really what our effort has been since we hired our content marketer, Dominique, who's doing a fantastic job is building content and writing in a way that is closely related to the product. So we're writing uh, content and we're, and we're building this kind of library of information uh, that is uh, so, so that we can say, Hey, Want to send onboarding emails? Uh, also, by the way, you can do this through messaging. Here's the top 10 tips for uh, how to onboard your customers, retain customers, pricing. Like, you know, we're basically showing how to use our own product to do the thing that we're teaching within the content. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been really key because then when we make the call to action, it's much more contextual, right? We're, we're, we're making it a lot closer. We're building the connection so that people don't have to go through the work of making that connection to themselves, understanding how this content relates to bare metrics. I love that. Um, and I guess that's, that's a good segue to the next question I want to ask you, uh, talking about how your metrics is actually helping people in terms of growing their business. Um, you know, I, I've been checking out your, your website, coreyhames.co, which I definitely recommend people go check out. It's where you got a lot of great content over there. Um, and, and what you know, he's got this list of the 10 topics that he would love to talk about on the podcast. <laughs> um, so I found a couple of things that I, I thought we could all really benefit from. And one of the questions, you know, I'd love to ask is, you know, what are the retention strategies? Um, that you wish you'd implemented a year ago, as you put it, um, and that you could do today. So talk about retention and how that can you know, help companies and how improve that. Sure. Yeah, I think I have the full post on the Bear Metrics blog if someone wants to go and read them all. I think there's maybe 10 or something like that, but I'll just list a couple. One of them, hands down, is um, combating fail charges and basically dunning. Uh, when it was crazy when we ran the numbers, so we we did a big kind of update for Recover, our Dunning product for Bear Metrics, um, in October of last year, 
And when we ran the numbers on basically the ROI of the tool, because I was building the landing page and I really wanted to show like, you know, since we can measure a lot of this, you know, what is it? And we found that on average, about 9% of someone's MRR was at risk to be lost due to failed charges every single month. So, you know, even if you like, uh, even if you're running crazy, you know, amount of ads and uh, you're killing it and you're growing, you still could be leaking out an insane amount of money every month, basically due to things that you can prevent, right? So with Recover and with Dunning, it doesn't matter what you use really, just we recommend having something that goes above and beyond what you have out of the box with a payment processor, pro, payment processor or subscription management platform um, because they're just going to do the bare minimum. If you are going out and you're uh, sending up a whole drip campaign of emails that go out within you know, 30 to 60 days, if you have a one-click place for someone to go to to uh, update their payment method and add a new credit card, that's a huge part of that because you don't want to give them a huge list of instructions or uh, have them go log into the app only to forget or procrastinate or you know, not make a priority. Mm -hmm. Having in-app widgets and, and reminders for anyone who isn't getting the emails or maybe is ignoring the emails because they're trying to get around the system or see if they can get the product for free, right? Um, and we found that that, I mean, it has been huge, right? It usually doubles uh, the retention, the revenue retention for a business. And, uh, and it's just an easy win to maximize revenue retention. And that's one of the things, whenever I talk to people, they're like, why haven't we done this before? As soon as they see the first month's numbers, right? Because they're just drastically better. Um, one of the other things has been exit surveys and basically like having an offboarding process. Again, this is really closely tied to one of our products, Cancellation Insights, but there's a reason. And there's a reason why we built it is because when people cancel and in bare metrics, you, you might get uh, a Slack notification or you might see it in the, in the weekly email report. And you're thinking, gosh, why did they cancel? You know, especially if they're a qualified uh, customer, if you liked them, if you've exchanged chats and when they cancel, you get nothing from that. So with Cancellation Insights, we're having just an exit survey in place in general what you can do is start to collect qualitative feedback within the cancellation process. Because what happens is if you try to reach out afterwards, you know, it's kind of an awkward conversation. Um, if you force them to go through chat, which you, you know, could maybe pull off maybe in the, in the early days, uh, but later on it makes people mad, right? And then they kind of have a bias or they don't want to give you an honest answer. Uh, or maybe they just want to, you know, be mean and say mean things to you. But if you have an anonymized way to collect feedback within the cancellation process, what you end up getting is really quality data on here's the reasons why people are canceling. Here's the most common reasons. Here are the most expensive reasons. And that basically gives you like a to-do list or kind of um, an action list of here's the things we need to do in, in order to improve retention. You know, it's people are saying that they're switching, switching to another product and then they're saying, here's what they're switching to and why. I mean, the, where else are you going to get that data? Right. Mm -hmm. And so with that information, you can build the right features. You can make the right changes to your pricing. You can position the product in a better way, right? You can do the things you need in order to kind of slowly work those reasons down and thus improve retention. And again, one of those things where every time someone implements it, they're like, I don't know how we were going about things before this because this data is just invaluable. So what's um, kind of the typical growth you'll, or, or savings, I guess you'll see from the results from these types of strategies? Yeah. I mean, it's really up to, you know, as with every analytics tool, and that's kind of the unfortunate part is that it's up to you on what you do with the data. But most of the time there's some, there's a couple of key insights that come up uh, that are just immediate kind of low hanging uh, wins. Usually one of them is uh, the most expensive, or I'm sorry, the, the most common reason people say that they're canceling across the board is usually it's too expensive. But what that means is that uh, either they're not getting enough value out of the product, um, or maybe the pricing structure just isn't optimized for them. You know, they're not on the right plan or you need to change your pricing in some way. So, so usually what you find, right, is that you need to introduce a new plan. For example, we actually, we found this where we had a lot of churn from our, uh, from our, basically our, our customers between 10 and $50,000 a month because the price was going up from 50 to a hundred and going after, basically after they would graduate from $10,000 in MRR, it felt really crappy for the for the price to double and now pay a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So we introduced a new, so we found, okay, everyone who's saying too expensive are all coming from this one plan. Let's just introduce a plan right there in between for anyone who's between 10 and $25,000 in MRR at 75 bucks a month. Yeah. And we've had like zero complaints since then, right? No one has, has given that reason since then. Mm -hmm. 
So simple tweaks like that, right? Missing features is a big one. Just go build the features people need in order to come back. Um, and another big one I, I usually see is um, uh, like technical issues, right? And so usually if, if you can resolve those issues because now they've made it known, someone might have a, a really bad technical issue and never say a, a complete word, right? So now if you're capturing the information as they're canceling, then you can reach back out to them and say, hey, I'm so sorry about that. You know, I think we can, we can have this resolved for you or we can recreate it. It's not gonna be an issue. Would you be, uh, consider becoming a customer again if we could uh, you know, fix this for you? And most people will say yes, right? Because they like the tool, they just, it didn't work for them because of some crazy bug or edge case. Thanks, that's great advice. I mean, you, know, you don't hear people talking about this too much in, in the marketing world. Um, you know, people are talking about you know, the user acquisition and, and, and maybe funnels and, and things like that, but there's just definitely not enough focus on like, how do you retain the people that you have? Um, because yeah. you know, it's much cheaper usually to, to retain the customer than it is to, to acquire a new one. Well, and, and the entire SaaS business model is built on subscription. It doesn't make sense to acquire tons and tons of customers and then to have your churn rate be, you know, 15, 25%. Yeah. You can acquire a third of the customers. If you're retaining them at, you know, if your uh, churn rate is only 5% or 2%, right? right. Your growth is going to be exponentially better long term. Um, so it makes much more sense, especially to, to focus on retention, but also to get it right and to do everything you can to, to maximize it. Absolutely. So, so it sounds like in terms of your job as a marketer, um, you're probably doing a great job, I would imagine, on the, on the retention side, considering it's the product that you guys do. So, so um, let's talk a little bit about kind of more you know, the, the growth strategies that you've been implementing. Um, you mentioned earlier that you tested a whole bunch of stuff that hasn't worked. Are there any uh, interesting stories or, or things that you expected that were going to work and you were so sure this would be the best test ever and it just totally failed? Um, anything you share there? Yeah, so my, my whole approach um, with Metrics since I've started has been uh, – and it's kind of, if you think about the, uh, the AARR funnel, Dave McClure kind of pirate metrics, you have acquisition, activation, retention, referral, revenue. Usually people start uh, top down, right? They'll start with the acquisition, you know, you redesign the website, you start running a bunch of ads, you start creating a bunch of content, right? And you just kind of ramp up the top of funnel. But for this exact reason, it ends up becoming a, a leaky bucket, right? If your retention isn't in place, referral, revenue, act, even activation, then it's kind of all for naught, right? Why would you be generating all these trials if you don't have a good way to activate them, retain them, and correctly monetize them, right? Or get them to invite other customers as well. And so I started bottom up. I started with revenue, looking at our pricing, looking at our kind of product suite, upselling, cross-selling, um, and then really making sure that there was, you know, ways basically where I could kind of leave that and know, uh, again, that people aren't going to complain about the price and they're not going to say it's too expensive They're, You know, we have things kind of dialed in there and then with referrals as well. Um, now for us, we don't have like a huge referral engine. Maybe the, the biggest one is probably like the open startups movement where people can pub publish their, um, their bare metrics dashboard publicly. Um, but for other businesses, especially, uh, if you have kind of like a collaborative tool or an end user experience, you know, like a Calendly or like a, uh, even like a help center, right. Or a chat tool are very common in these optimizing for that can be, it can be huge, right? Why would you focus on paying for new customers when you can get your existing customers to invite new ones? Anyways, mm -hmm. focus on retention. Um, uh, looked at that, talked to a lot of customers. And one of the first things I did was just sit down with 20 of our best customers, got to know everything I possibly could about them, learned, you know, what they're looking for, what's missing, what they want uh, to be done differently. Then I moved to activation and that's really where, you know, like I said, a lot of those things that I've tried did not work and we kind of flailed around and tried a bunch of different things and I think we've definitely moved the needle up, right? But, and we found a few things that have, that have uh, improved things, but it's not like it's been a, a huge home run. Now on the acquisition side, um, we haven't run any paid ads. We've mostly been doubling down what's already been working, which is content and SEO. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things I'll say that uh, has been a mixed bag is um, has been webinars. And it's hard to tell because what I wanted to do, my, my goal was to make use of our newsletter a lot more because we have a, a big newsletter, a big following. But we just weren't, wasn't, weren't engaging it very much. So I figured, why don't I run these workshops where I, um, you know, sit down with, you know, about a area of expertise that I can talk about. I bring in a partner or someone else, you know, an agency owner, a consultant, uh, even a technology partner, maybe who can speak to something. And then let's just do something weekly, right? Where we can engage people, I'll have a special call to action. 
and people loved it. And we had great attendance, tons of registrations, but it, I couldn't tell really if it was turning into customers, uh, mm-hmm. nothing kind of anecdotal. It was very minimal. You know, really the only way I could tell was if someone booked a demo afterwards, um, or really it was, you know, I was kind of framing it as like a strategy call. And then, uh, at, at the end I would ask, uh, or give them a link to bear metrics for, uh, with a coupon. But, um, it, I would say that it, uh, I, I can't tell if it really made use of our newsletter, or if it really worked. And I put a lot of time into it, to be honest, like running a weekly webinar it is a lot of work. Mm-hmm. You know, you're sourcing people, you're looking through slides, you're, you're actually doing the webinar, you're promoting it, you're sending it to the list. Um, so that's probably one of the things that, uh, I can put a stamp on and say, no, oh, probably not for us, or at least not the way that we did it. We need to revisit that. Okay, good. That's, uh, that's valuable. You gotta learn what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And, and not uh, wow. to say that webinars don't work at all. I'm not saying, that. in fact, there probably were a lot of things that did work about it. Uh, it just did not work in the way that we wanted it to, and that it converted into customers. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, well, I mean, you've, you've given us a, a, a ton to think about. Um, and, and definitely not the uh, typical direction that most of my, my uh, podcasts go. So, so that's great. There's going to be some uh, huge value for people. Uh, to be honest, I'm already thinking about which of my clients could I be recommending their metrics to because, you know, with, with us, with paid ads, and this is something people should keep in mind, you know, thinking about the churn and increasing long-term value, you know, they, they say in marketing, he, he who can afford to pay the most to acquire a customer wins. So if you can increase that LTV by decreasing, you know, increasing prices, maybe decreasing churn, et cetera, you can afford to pay more to acquire a top of funnel lead with your paid ads, wherever they might be, whether that's Google or Facebook or anything else. Um, so this is really, it seems like a relatively easy win to be using bare metrics and, and, and implementing these strategies that you spoke about today so that A, you're going to keep your revenue, but then B, you can now know that you could afford to pay more, which allows you to put more fuel in the fire to be able to grow things even faster, knowing you're going to keep those customers even longer. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the big things um, that we're kind of moving into now is just making it easier for people to pipe in data to bare metrics so that they can get more insights on um, product usage and retention, uh, you know, things like last click attribution, um, any insights into how they've engaged with you in the past so that you can build these segments and say, okay, you know, for my MRR, my churn, my lifetime value of these different groups of customers, how are they different, right? Who's our most profitable? Who's not profitable? Mm-hmm. Um, how, who should we be doubling down on? Who should we not? Where you can split them up into really any group that you want to, as long as you can get the data into bare metrics, but I appreciate the kind words. Very cool. Uh, super. Let's jump into lightning round. Five quick questions, a little, little bit more about you. What makes you tick? So uh, what's the situation? Are you single, married, kids? Uh, married, no kids, one dog. All right, great. Um, what book would you recommend for listeners to read? Business, not business, doesn't matter. Yeah, um, man, obviously awesome by April Dunford. It's been one of the one of my favorite books. Super easy to read, really practical, but also very insightful. It's all about positioning, uh, which is something that I feel like most marketers have no idea what to do um, or, or how to do it. And, uh, man, it's just a game changer once you really understand, uh, that the positioning is kind of the cornerstone of all of your marketing. If you can really get that down, everything becomes easier. Um, so that's the one I've been handing out to people left and right. Okay. Awesome. The tr- truth is you're the second person to mention her in my last couple of episodes. And in fact, she's my next interview. April Dunford is going to be coming on the show soon. So, uh, awesome. I- I'm, I think yeah. I'm buying that book and reading it quickly before I-, I get the opportunity to chat with her. You can do it. It's, it's an amazing read. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I've heard good things. Um, what's your favorite marketing or productivity tool? Ooh, I'm going to have to, um, you know, something I've been, I've been really getting into, and I think this is really important that again, a lot of, not a lot of marketers do, or even really people do mm-hmm. is kind of building up your, um, knowledge library somewhere where you're just kind of collecting all of your learnings, things you read, mm-hmm. um, summaries. Um, and so I've been really enjoying Rome research, which is kind of like the, the hot new tool in tech right now, but basically it's like a, super powered note taking tool that allows for like bi-directional linking and you can create infinite amount of pages and it shows you connections and whatnot. So I've been really enjoying that for like dumping in thoughts about marketing, uh, summaries, even for, for life and business in general. And then paired with that has been another new tool, um, called my mind, my mind.com. And it's basically a, a Chrome extension that uh, allows you to save anything on the internet. Um, and allows you to easily search for it afterwards. And one of the things I've been really trying to do, and it's kind of hence my, my newest project, Swipe Files, uh, is creating a swipe file and just having things to be able to curate from and 
um, and learn from. And so I'm always grabbing examples of great copy, great landing pages, great ads that I see, um, even other things, you know, just typing notes to myself. So um, those two, especially in the context of marketing, like if you can have something to, to draw on and not just start from scratch all the time, it's invaluable. Right. And, and as you, you've mentioned it, um, I know you've got your Swipe Files project you're working on. Um, where, where do people find that? Swipefiles.co. Cool. So I, I've checked that out. It's actually pretty cool. I definitely recommend this one to go check that out. Um, cool. Who's your favorite marketer you learning from right now? Who, who are you paying a lot of attention to? Yeah, Seth Godin, hands down. He's my, he's my hero. Um, I love that guy. I just, you know, and it's not... Um, practical quote unquote in in the way that he's not going to tell you like here's how to craft a perfect ad uh -huh. but i mean he's the most amazing storyteller orator just really helps you understand what marketing is all about and that it's about ideas and it's about creating tribes uh, people like us do things like this i think that the way that he just kind of st distills things um is like, is like no other so i read all of his stuff reread all of his stuff uh, all the time great um, and right now, what's your favorite online community that you're, that you're hanging out and learning from? Hmm. I love Indie Hackers. Indie Hackers has a special place in my heart. It's IndieHackers.com. I've um, been there for a couple of years, but you know, just people trying to make a living on the internet through SaaS and e-commerce and uh, online products. And uh, so I always love connecting with online entrepreneurs and aspiring one myself as well. And so it's usually, you know, where you can find me uh, lurking most of the time. <laughs> awesome. I know you might be lurking there, but you're creating a, a ton of content across the internet. You know, I took a deep dive into trying to follow all the things you're doing and, and it was exhausting. So, so tell us <laughs> a little bit, where can they go to find out more about you and the projects that you're working on? Yeah, the best place is probably just my website, which is coreyhaines.co. Mm -hmm. um, and there I list all my projects. I have a job board for marketers called Hey Marketers. Uh, a couple of courses, mental models for marketing and refactoring growth. And then my latest project, Swipe Files. Um, and so follow me on Twitter as well. It's probably where I'm the most active. And if you want to DM me with any questions, I'm more than happy to chat. Awesome. Corey, this has been amazing. Uh, great episode. You've shared a ton of uh, unique perspective that, that I think is really going to add a lot of value to all the SaaS marketers and founders that are listening to this. So thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, happy to be on. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate. We'd love to chat. Great.